Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, for years it has been a given that our region enjoys an exceptionally deep and broad reputation among all of our higher education institutions. It's also fair to say, and it's easy to say in fact, that a good part of that comes from legacy sports programs. No brainer. But it's not just sports that drive competition. Academically and through advancing new policy, our schools have been at the center and driven much of the development of our expanding life sciences industry. Welcome again and thanks for tuning into the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. On this program, what promise does life science sector have for our region and where are we in the process? And can it be a core area of growth going forward? And how does it play into our debate around the broader public policy issues of the day? Well, in a moment, we will deliberate the issues with our panel of experts. Stay with us. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded June 7th, 2013. On this week's program, Corey Curtis of the North Carolina Biotechnology Center, Bill Mahoney of SCRA, and Wayne Roper of SC Bio. Now, Chris Williams. Wow. Uh, welcome to our program. You know, we always start with the good dialogues right before the cameras come on, don't we? And we, I, I know I say that all the time. Welcome to the program. Good to have you all here. Corey, welcome for the first time. Thank you for having it me. It might be a very uncomfortable, so we co hope you come back. Uh, I'm delighted <laughs> to, to have this expert next to me. So. I, I want to read a quote for you. Let, let me start here. And it was in the uh, News and Observer out of Raleigh. And it, there, in, in North Carolina, and, and you may know or know not, that, that there's a star chemistry professor in the UNC system named Joe. Joe Simone and Joe is, is very well thought of, a very smart guy, ha owns many patents or has many patents to his name, a, a great professor and very inclusive when it comes to life sciences and biotech. And Joe Simone said recently, he said, you know, this region, meaning the Carolinas, used to drive a lot of uh, big ideas, applied research and economic development. And he said, now in some ways we've kind of lost our mojo. Bill, have we lost our mojo in life sciences? Is this something that's been a little sidetracked because of the economy or or whatever? Well, I, th I think if you're coming from the academic qu quarter, uh, there's a lot of concerns about uh, National Science Foundation and NIH funding over the next few years. And some of the research enterprises in the universities have actually declined year over year over the last couple of years. So I think that's a, that's a normal perception, I think, mm -hmm. uh, if you're in the academy. I think where we're going, and we're involved in a lot of the commercialization process, we're gaining momentum there. Uh, we're seeing more companies form. We're seeing more different kinds of uh, applications of the bioscience, uh, particularly in health and medical treatments. Huge growth in bioinformatics. So all you computer f folks out there, there's plenty of work to do in the, in the life sciences industry uh, coming from the computer side. So I think as you bridge from the laboratory and the bench into the marketplace, there's a lot more going on both in North Carolina and South Carolina. But Wayne, before you jump in, doesn't, doesn't the DNA of, of a lot of the work that comes out of life sciences, doesn't it start in the classroom or our class lab? You have to begin with great uh, discovery resources. That's what life science is about. It's about intellectual property. It's about discovery. And you have to have that kind of dedication. So yes, and, and the federal role here is a critical and, and central role for 
for uh, developing those discovery resources. There's no one else to do that. That's, that is a legitimate role. And uh, just under sequester to, to mm -hmm. take uh, $1.6 billion out of the NIH budget means 700 less research grants. So the, the concern is serious. But uh, to follow up on what Bill is saying, I think uh, what uh, he might be referring to, your uh, researcher, is the fact that no one now owns biotech. It, it, you can see discovery happening everywhere. It's gone through a dis, uh, kind of a transition. The major big pharma companies are downsized. Their research and development is now being sought out in uh, outsourced kind of areas in, in small discovery spots and, and labs. And, and they are exploring um, uh, new horizons of discovery in uh, personalized medicine, in nutraceuticals, in some of the things, uh, genetics and genomics, uh, big data. Um, so what we're seeing is, is really a, an expansion of the discovery. It's not located in just a few mm -hmm. centers. Does, uh, does Professor DeSimone, is he hit on something here, though, with this losing the mojo idea? I don't think so. In terms of economic development, in the state of North Carolina, we've had three and a half times the national growth rate in, la in the biotech sector from 2001 to 2010. So while the private sector is experiencing a, a decline at 2.8 percent of jobs, that's growing. So perhaps to, to what my colleagues are speaking of, it may seem that way. And it's certainly a real concern for, for academicians with National Institutes of Health and National Science Foundation reductions. But from co a commercialization standpoint, we're, we continue to see that growth. And that's a result of mm -hmm. years and years of hard work. You know, do, 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 does this region still lead? I mean, there were some specific areas like the West Coast and the Northeast, Bill. And I know you're familiar with some of the Boston sure. investment up there. But does, does the, do the Carolinas, I mean, do they still have a top five status? Well, not in uh, not in comparison to some of the corridors you'll find in Boston and, and California, obviously. And I don't mean from a dollar standpoint. I, I, maybe, well, maybe I, a mojo standpoint. Well, maybe okay. That's a so, way to so say it. our rate of company formation, job creation, capital accretion, yeah. those types of things, right. we're, we're we're starting from a much smaller base, obviously, than those established corridors. However, our rate of growth is much much higher. Than those. So even though you know it's th th they're still in the lead from the rule of big numbers, but the reality is our ramp is very aggressive. Is is the biggest largest challenge funding? Is that it? Access to capital. That's part of it. The the other part is uh, forming the daisy chain of partnerships that ha that you have to create around any one particular company company or discovery in order to get it from the lab uh, mm -hmm. or the bench into you know, uh, clinical trials, then FDA approvals, then into, you know, a, usually with a development company, and then ultimately there to a, a distribution deal with a larger, you know, more established mm -hmm. pharma uh, player. Yeah. A couple or, of comments there. The state of North Carolina is the third largest biotechnology cluster in the country. So I think that's that's what I was looking that's, for. Yeah. Uh, that certainly speaks to, you know, for, from my position, the North Carolina Biotechnology Center's 30-year effort to build that. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, and as far as is funding the major concern, it depends on who you ask. And I right. think that's, that's one of the issues. So I may deal with a company, and I just dealt with one last week, that said, I don't really need capital. I need connectivity. Yep. And that's one of the big things that our organization provides. So we're bridging gaps. and communicating between an economic, excuse me, an economic developer, uh, someone from academia, and an industry person to, to foster that growth. So then what connections are missing? Well, for, for South Carolina, we definitely need to, to have a more commercial or private industry connection, because I think we're forming those early chains very well. Clemson. Is that, yeah, I'm sorry, Wayne, but let me interrupt you. Is that a Bosch? Is that a 3M? Is that having a major marquee name with an R&D budget? It doesn't have to be a marquee name. It just has to be somebody who's ready to build the jobs off of the discovery that we're doing. Um, for instance, Clemson is joining with Greenville Health System to develop more clinical uh, research and clinical uh, commercializing uh, re um, treatments and therapeutics. Uh, they're forming a genetic center with uh, the Greenwood Genetic Campus. Um, and every, every research university is really moving strongly into translational types of research, research that can be easily commercialized. We need to now bring those industries back into uh, South Carolina to look at what we're doing and try to build the jobs off of it. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, from SCRA's point of view, we've been able to invest in, at the very earliest stage, you know, outside, first outside money typically into those the companies that Wayne's talking about. Uh, and, and we're now getting the attention and interest of some of the, uh, well, venture capital doesn't really exist anymore the way it did in the 90s, but, the, but private investors who really are, who know the space, want to come in and do something strategic and uh, part of the reason that we've been able to get a significant multiplier effect on our investments in these companies, 40 of which are in Wayne's association, mm -hmm. is because um, we're on to something in terms of our focus on certain vertical markets, uh, diagnostics, therapeutics, clinical apps, in cancer, stroke, bi diabetes, and neuro neuropathology. And, that, and that's, there are strengths in our institutions all the way from MUSC through the University of South Carolina into Greenville Hospital System mm -hmm. in those areas. So we, we have a, a, a market focus. We can um, deliver very uh, high retention, cost-effective trials because of the small footprint that we have. And for development companies and discovery companies coming in, that, that that's a very cost-effective bet. So when you when you articulate this out, whether you're trying to articulate it out to a to, to a committee in, at the state house in Columbia, I mean, I would I would guess the success can almost sell itself if you get to public po those who make policy. Yeah, I think you have to show the result, though. Um, can you have, show the result? Oh, absolutely. We uh, we we have a. a a company that we helped start called Immunologics, a member of Wayne's Association. They were acquired by a company named Intrexon. Through that exit, we were, not only did we do well and a private investor do extremely well, but we also turn, turned the foundation for research and development at a medical university of South Carolina from a cost center to a profit center. So why wouldn't that, that sell itself? Why couldn't you go to the General Assembly and say, you need to help us? And what would that help look like, Wayne? Well, in fact, we have, and we've been successful. We've uh, just recently passed through the General Assembly a, a tax credit for angel investors, angels being those early investors in, in these discovery uh, and uh, discovery resources. And angel investors are the first and the most critical chain in moving it to a commercialized uh, application. And so uh, the tax credit puts us at a competitive uh, footing with Georgia and North Carolina, which similarly offer that kind of credit. They are beginning to understand that this is, these small business, high impact businesses build two thirds of the uh, jobs, mm -hmm. in a, net jobs in an economy. Yeah, we had uh, statistics from the Moore School uh, about our respective clients mm -hmm. and professional scientific and technical jobs in South Carolina actually grew by about 4% a year through the Great Depression when the overall state was going to 10 percent unemployment mm -hmm. the the knowledge economy jobs that these companies are helping to create actually grew through so that period. okay so in north carolina with the proposed cuts in the in the mccrory budget in in the house in the senate well, how how do, how do you turn that dialogue how do you make the case that wayne and bill are making how do you do that corey in north carolina i think we do that every day and we continue to do that by telling the story of the successes so we've got fifty eight thousand biotech jobs in the state um, that equates to a you know a 59 billion dollar economic impact, uh, second only to agriculture in the state of North Carolina. Do you think so, they understand that, or do they think the, that these are few jobs that pay a lot of money, and they're not? It's not a call center that's a thousand jobs or 500 jobs. I think I think they do understand that, and I think we just need to continue to repeat it. So you're talking 58,000 jobs, um, the average salary being $78,000. And then for every one of those biotech jobs created, it creates four additional jobs. So now you compound that, it's 237,000 jobs for the state. And those are the, the types of messages that we need to continue to tell, and those are the types of stories that we need to continue to tell. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about what the future may hold. And just, just this week, I had a call from um, a woman in Virginia asking about the models that are happening in, in the biotech sector between North and South Carolina, and specifically in the greater Charlotte region, uh, wanting to know, well, how, how do you do that? And how, you seem to have a great track record and some great success stories. So I think that the legislature has an understanding, and we just need to continue uh, to tell that story. Do you, do you, um, uh, uh, you know, I don't even know how to ask this because I'm, I'm even going to quote it wrong, but um, it, it is. Is any chance to get funding back the proposed cuts? Is there is there a chance you can get that back, or are you going to abandon that for now? No, I think we, the center has has a great chance of getting that back. Yeah. We've worked really very hard 
Um, certainly all of us that are in the regions, we're, the, we're basically the boots on the ground. We have high levels of connectivity with all of our academic institutions, certainly with all of the uh, economic developers in the area, industry, of course. Um, we, we talk to industry every day, and they're telling us what we need. So that drives what the educational format looks like in terms of feeding the pipeline. Mm -hmm. They're telling us what kind of credentialing people, you know, people need. So we're playing, I think, a, a, a pivotal role in the success of the biotech industry, at least in the state of North Carolina. Well, in the state of South Carolina, you think about you think about the great successes in the upstate with BMW and all the associated automotive manufacturers. Now you think the flag in the ground in the low country with Boeing. Sure. How can you make the case, and can the case be argued, uh, that biotech, that life sciences, will be that industrial cluster that will that will will be one of the core industries of growth for well, South Carolina. I, I can quote our uh, Secretary of Commerce who said that South Carolina is building its reputation in the life science club, which is to say we are emerging and we are we are developing a lot of the resources that we have. Does commerce have your and back? They do. Oh, they, they, they really understand that and that's why Business Facilities Magazine said we are one of the sixth uh, leading emerging biotech hubs. It's just an emerging, we are emerging with some of the investment that's been going on in the last 10 years, largely with SCRA and what they've done, and, uh, and what the universities are now doing in their collaborations and in their, in their work. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the last two years, 1,300 jobs, 340 million in capital investment has been announced. Um, Nephron Pharmaceuticals is coming on with 700 jobs, and those will have BA degrees, uh, averaging seventy thousand uh, dollars a year, so uh, th I think there is a drumbeat that's beginning in South Carolina. Is there? And this is a one-off. I just thought: is, is there a? Uh, is there kind of a locale? Is it happening in Columbia? Is it happening in Charleston? Where is it going on? All over. Is it? Yeah. There. Uh, you know, a, a lot of what we're doing in the knowledge economy tends to be more connected to the urban centers. Mm -hmm. But what the one of the interesting things about life sciences is that we're starting to discover. Uh, both uh, in the food, fiber, and uh, forestry segments that are about 30% of South Carolina's economy, mm -hmm. we're finding new applications. Uh, you know, there are um, uh, microbes that can remediate brown fields, for example. And uh, so, then how do you remediate the microbes? Well, they they, <laughs> they tend to take care of themselves, yeah. particularly if you plant the right cover crop on top of them. All right, so so those types of combined technologies for applied projects are starting to make their way into the rural parts. Of the state. Let me come back to one of the DNAs of this, and that's the educational component. What what happens in states that look so hard? And and I'm specifically talking about K through 12 education. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the DNA of where these guys, the, these boys and girls, are going to be coming from. Uh, when you've got when you're when you're you're fighting with budgets when you're fighting with local school systems to try to figure that out but but more importantly than that you, you let's follow that through the continuum all right the kids come out of school um, and and business after business on this program at least the last two years have said but there is a skills gap we can't find the workers we need North Carolina has one of the highest unemployment rates in the nation but companies are saying that they can't find the workers they need so Corey how do you address that skills gap I think we address it in a number of ways. The North Carolina uh, Biotechnology Center offers an education division. We have a unit that specializes in that. So in addition to educational grants that go to help equipment, and talking K-12 specifically, uh, help with equipment in classrooms and teacher training programs is a very successful program of ours. So we run summer um, pro training programs mm -hmm. for, for educators. And one of the projects that we've been involved in, I think that, that, that draws uh, a variety of, of participants and partners for the center is uh, an initiative we worked with, ironically, with motorsports. You wouldn't think life sciences and motorsports go together, but it's a Golden Leaf funded uh, mm -hmm. pre, uh, program. And we've worked very closely in North Carolina Motorsports Association and a number of institutions, the research campus up in Kannapolis and uh, all of the folks up there to administer a program for eighth graders, which was identified as, you know, as a target group whereby they need something that entices them into the STEM disciplines. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about the pipeline and, and creating that all along the way, that's a piece of the puzzle. So making sure that those students have, that we're, we're, we're generating enough students interested in those disciplines to feed that later on. So can you do the, some of the work of the guidance counselors and reach down in that K through 12 and say, listen, uh, consider life sciences because this is what's going on. And not only that, we'll bring you into apprenticeship programs. And I might be taking some of your thunder here. I don't know that. Well, the, 
Uh, it's shown that if you can give uh, kids at the middle school level and on a vision of what they could be doing, um, they, the performance improves, their, their drive and their motivation improves. We are, we're doing a great job with information. It's motivation that where, where kids stop uh, trying to achieve in, in school, they don't see what the future holds for them. So if we get in the middle school level and show them some of the jobs they can be doing, and particularly in South Carolina, that they don't need to have a four-year degree. You, you don't, uh, a two years in a credential program could be sufficient for having a job that would pay $50,000 a year in South Carolina. Do, do middle school kids get genomics and genetics and big data? I mean, it, well, there, there is a program that's uh, several years old in the state of South Carolina now called the Jab, Job Shadowing Program. It was sponsored by a number of corporations and the State Chamber of Commerce. And what is now uh, existent in, for middle school students in the state is uh, a, a set of uh, sessions that are operable on a laptop computer where they walk the students through uh, they, they have over 2,100 different types of professional mm -hmm. and uh, technical jobs that are portrayed. And the, it, that the feedback from those students and their aptitude tests that they take as part of that job shadowing activity is now fed into a program because all South Carolina high school students need to select an area of concentration by their sophomore year in high school. So that's part of the front end of it, and the other part is, uh, you know, the chair of the technical college system sits on our board, gets a good view, I think, into, um, you know, what's developing in terms of these uh, vertical markets that we're attacking. And then uh, they're able to take programs like Ready SC and the job, if a nephron comes into the state, uh, somebody like uh, Dr. White at Midlands Technical College is right with that company as they prepare to uh, credential a graduating mm -hmm. set of students from Midlands Technical College coming. The other thing I will say quickly is that you see it, over 20 percent of the students now in the South Carolina Technical College system are actually bachelor's graduates who are coming back for two-year certifications in a particular profession. So field. the technical college, you're saying 20 percent of the technical college in North Carolina would be a community college system. 20 yeah. percent of those are, are kids with undergraduate degrees. Yeah, right. they're coming back to get pro the, the professional training. Retraining. Great example of that is Roanne Cabarrus up in Kannapolis with the uh, North Carolina Research Campus. So they, they run the biotech and feed right into all of those, those industry needs. Do, do, do you all find, and this might be a leading question, but do you find that kids, maybe middle school, Wayne, maybe younger, maybe older, do you find they have an appetite for this type of training and this type of career? Corey, do you see this? My nine-year-old does, and then I see it every day with, uh, with the eighth graders that are in that program. I think that- And I'm not talking about playing Minecraft. I'm talking no, about something beyond no, that. No, no. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think it really has, it has a profound effect on them when they have exposure to things that they didn't know existed. So just being on the campus, on the research campus, we have students from, from all over, from, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. from Richmond County, from Cabarrus County, excuse me, um, from Rowan Salisbury. So all of those students are coming to campus and they're being exposed to things that they, they normally wouldn't see in the course of a school day. And we're mm -hmm. talking about those industry connections, yeah. whereby they have the opportunity, not only to talk to the industry folks, but the, the students in, at UNC Charlotte and the College of Engineering, they're gonna listen to uh, an 18, 19, 20 year old student mm -hmm you know, far better than they are any of us over over 30. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. uh, it's pretty exciting to see happen. In about 30 seconds. Well, we've also seen in Charleston where we have our innovation center, it's in Upper Meeting Street. There's mm -hmm. a middle school, primarily minority students, diagonally across the street. In our community room there, we host visits from those students who can walk through the wet labs that are in our innovation center. And to have that experience to go in there and see those children light up when they see actually what one of the white robe scientists does, uh, it's, it's inspirational and they carry that away with them. Is there any, any kind of uh, anecdotal evidence that you can see that, that these kids are being drawn into the system or are they just interested in what's they're, going on? They're interested. We, don't, we haven't tracked you know, what the, the left to right you know, migratory studies are, but uh, you know, wait with us a while. We, we're coming yeah. up with a solution for yeah, that. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Why does that not surprise me? Uh, good to have you all on the program. Thank you very much. And Bill, nice to see you again. Thank you. Good.
Wayne, good luck over there. I can tell I can tell you're excited about it as well. Yeah. You should. And Corey, you know, you you, have, you might have changed a little bit how I f- have felt about where we were going in North Carolina and South Carolina. But thank you both. Thank you all three. Good to have you in the program. Uh, until next week, I'm Chris William. We hope your weekend is good and you, your summer starts out well as well. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, Our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care, when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services, with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.